afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the latest webinar produced by intellectual property law firm Stern Kessler, Goldstein and Fox. Today's topic is Options for Accelerating Patent Examination, where we will discuss new fast-track patent strategies in the United States and around the world. All lines have been placed in a listen-only mode. If you have a question during today's presentation, please submit it via the Q&A box located in the control panel on the right side of your screen. If we do, don't have a chance to answer your question prior to the end of today's discussion, we will follow up directly to make sure you receive an answer. Today's presenters are Stern Kessler Directors Mike Messenger and John Covert. At this point, it is my pleasure to turn the call over to Mike Messenger. Hi, everyone, and welcome again. Uh, this is Mike Messenger. I'm a partner here at Stern Kessler. I'm here with my fellow partner, John Covert. Uh, we practice in the area of fast-track patent examination. I primarily uh, focus on software, electronics, clean tech, and renewable uh, energies. John focuses on life science, biotech, and chemical areas. And uh, both of us are former patent examiners from the patent office and actually old enough to remember the days when the patent office uh, had a pendency goal of 18 months to first office action by 19. 86 for those of you who remember those days. Uh, anyway, today we're going to do uh, walk you through kind of a remarkable world of the new fast pack, new fast track patent strategies that are available to patent applicants. So to get started, why don't we just take a quick look at some of the um, the changes that we're, we're talking about with respect to timing. Um, in the old world, that uh, many of the applications and many of you on the on the call might be familiar with. Um, one approach for what we call standard prosecution, a uh, company would file in the United States. Um, there'd be kind of a queue waiting for that first office action pendency to get uh, start the active examination process. It wasn't uncommon for that to take three to five years to complete um, for many patent applications in a variety of technologies. Um, concurrent with that, um, many companies would file internationally. Uh, one approach was to do what's called the PCT, Patent Cooperation Treaty patent application. Um, often that would take uh, 30 months to begin a national phase process. You know, in between the two processes, um, it was a, a cycle of about three to five years before um, final disposition um, where applicants would either get a patent grant um, or final um, abandonment. Um, in this remarkable new world that we're in, um, there's a number of options. We're going to go through in detail um, some formal ones and informal ones. But just look at one of them um, in the U.S. Um, now available track one procedure where from filing to actual final disposition, um, applicants are getting um, notice of allowance uh, within nine months on average. Uh, we're, we've seen some uh, here at the firm as fast as 37 days. Uh, we're seeing some that are uh, coming in around five, six months as well. Um, the overall office of nine months is quite remarkable uh, in terms of timing, as well as that in connection with the patent prosecution highway, which is another uh, vehicle that many companies are using. Uh, we're seeing similar acceleration on the, on the international um, cases of the patent prosecution highway. We're seeing um, some of them get final disposition uh, from filing uh, within a year as well. And so there's also, um, in connection with that, um, we're also seeing some changes in the world of patent enforcement. Uh, one in the old world, a couple years ago, pre-America Events Act, um, we often would see a district court litigation, and some of the slower or average courts uh, would, would be taking about 2.5 years from trial to completion. And, we're, and concurrent with that, many applicants uh, or defendants would be filing what was known then as inter-party re-examination. And these processes, for a number of reasons, um, uh, often would, would get extended, uh, wouldn't end, basically. Um, and they were taking like 30 to 40 months to complete. So collectively, the litigation and then the testing of the patent again at the patent office, um, we're looking at a time frame around three plus years. In this new world, uh, with uh, the availability of inter-party review, covered business methods, um, the oversight of the PTAB, um, administered adjudication by the PTAB, um, we're seeing some tight time deadlines, and the patent office is meeting those deadlines. So we're seeing one year less from the time um, these trials get started to the time they complete, um, which is creating, it's relevant to today's discussion, because we're seeing a lot of our fast-track strategies are coming out of situations where there is concurrent litigation. 
and patent owners are uh, advancing some alternative um, assets as well as defendants trying to advance some of their alternative assets to reinforce different litigation positions. And so as Mike mentioned, it, it really is a new world uh, for anybody practicing patent law today, uh, both in, in terms of the new opportunities that we have for, for prosecution as well as dealing with the impact of the new post-grant proceedings at the patent office. And so um, we don't have the answers to all, all the different questions and, and, and scenarios that will arise, but it's very, very important that as a practitioner, that you think about the fast track opportunities, uh, whether you're procuring applications at an early stage uh, of a product or in a technology that moves very fast, or if it's later in, in the life cycle where you may have continuations or divisionals pending and you do have either a litigation ongoing or one of these new PTAB proceedings, um, there, there are opportunities to employ some of the fast track strategies uh, to help your clients. Uh, and so, you know, it impacts everything that, that we do, preparation, prosecution, litigation, licensing, it cuts across all technologies and, and practice groups, as you'll see from some later slides, and, uh, you know, it, it has some useful impact on the product life cycle management for, for the various products. Uh, and, you know, it's still, we haven't done away with the traditional patent prosecution pathway that you can still elect to go in, file your applications, and, and kind of use the traditional pathway of waiting for the examina examination to occur um, and, and kind of letting things play out the old way. And so what are some of the opportunities that are now available? The America Events Act is, is now fully implemented. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, we have as part of that is, is the fast track examination. Their patent office has been very innovative in terms of trying various pilot programs. And so uh, a number of programs have, have been rolled out. Uh, some are kind of gone by the wayside. Other ones are still in place. And it seems like the, the Patent Office is trying out various types of, of different programs to see if it, it helps both the public, both the applicants and the Patent Office in, in kind of getting their applications examined. Uh, and, you know, this is just not only uh, something that's occurring in the United States. There is this kind of concept of accelerating patent examination that's occurring worldwide, uh, both with Patent Prosecution Highway and accelerated examination in places like Europe. So every good webinar, uh, we try to provide a takeaway. Um, I think this is the takeaway. Um, this is a, a slide, this is a diagram that is now available on the Patent Office website. It's a little tricky to find it, um, but the Patent Office has collected all of the available ways to accelerate um, patents in the United States now and actually some of them internationally, and they've organized them by the particular vehicle available as well as the time in which it's most likely to be used, whether it's at filing, whether it's at first office action or final rejection or appeal or even allowance and, and post allowance. We're going to step through the major ones here, but I would encourage all of you to find this on the PTO website. Um, to find it, you need to go to the PTO website, uspto.gov. You go under patents, and then you click initiatives and events, and then that lands you on this page. Also, at the end of our slide deck, we provide the link and a resources um, slide, so you can also access it through the slide deck as well. Um, it's quite remarkable. Each of these blocks here, track one, accelerated examination, first full action view pilot. Um, each one of these also has a hyperlink, which hyperlinks you to the information uh, that the Patent Office provides on how to actually carry out these different options. Um, it's, it's quite a handy tool. They just posted it. I would encourage all of you to bookmark it in your, your browser um, if you can. Um, the real power of these acceleration um, techniques is not just individually, um, but when you actually start using them in combination, and that's what we're finding out um, in many different situations. Um, companies and vendors are finding themselves um, either using uh, like a, a track one application or a track one continuation. They're using it in combination with um, some advanced interviewing techniques. Um, and then even at the back end of the process, we're finding people using their interviewing techniques plus track one RCE, um, plus the patent prosecution highway, plus some of the, um, the 
Quick Path IDS and After Final 2.0 program. We're going to go into each of these uh, individually next. Um, but I want to alert everybody to the, the real power from this comes when you're looking at your patent portfolio strategy and using these tools uh, in combination with each other. So, so let's go do a deeper dive on track one. Uh, this is the one that's been ushered in by the American Events Act. Uh, many patent attorneys, it's been kind of on their wish list for years. Uh, and it is remarkable in that um, you're able to, for the first time, you basically file a petition, pay a fee, um, it is quite significant. It's four thousand dollars for a large entity, two thousand for a small entity. Um, but the patent office will take that application and move it to the top of the queue. Um, it's called Track One. Um, prioritize examination is the term that the patent office uses to call it. Um, I just put the current stats, um, but from the time of filing to the time of final disposition, which in the patent office, uh, what they mean by that, they mean final rejection or notice allowance. Um, to that final disposition, um, it is 9.0 months is what it's averaging now. And like I said before, we're seeing a lot of cases um, earlier than that. That's just an average. So to another way to think about it, um, when you're thinking about in track one and trying to get in that track one mindset um, compared to the standard prosecution, um, um, in the standard prosecution, a lot of that initial time is waiting in that queue for first office action. Um, as you can see in this bar graph here. Um, and then there's a time spent where the applicant is making decisions on preparing replies, uh, preparing to pay issue fees, some steps that the applicant is controlling the timing of. And then there's some prosecution time with the office. Uh, you can see just by filing track one um, and getting first in line of the queue, it has a dramatic effect on the overall pendency time. In fact, um, you know, we're often seeing the first office action on the order of like five months, 5.6 months is the current patent office staff, staff for the aggregate um, time to first office action. And you know, the applicant has some control over how fast they respond um, in terms of preparing a reply, preparing that issue fee, making decisions on the asset. Um, but even then, collectively, uh, we're seeing you know, a, a great reduction in the, the time end to end from filing to actual patent grant under track one. So just some of the basic requirements. Um, happily, um, uh, to some extent, Congress and the Patent Office listened uh, to patent applicants and tried to make it fairly simple and straightforward um, in terms of the procedural aspects. Um, it basically is, uh, there's some requirements to uh, make your application comply. Uh, it has to be an original, non-provisional patent application um, that is complete um, in that you know, there's a declaration and the fees are paid when you file it. Um, needs to be filed electronically, and um, you have to pay all the fees up front, the filing fees and the excess claim fees. Um, and then there's a one-page uh, form that's kind of the track one request that you need to complete that's kind of the request for prioritized examination. Um, and there is some claim limits in that it can't be more than 30 total claims and four independent claims. Going above that um, violates the track one process and won't qualify, so it needs to be meet that claim limit and you do have the additional $4,000 or $2,000 prioritized examination fee. Um, and as I mentioned before, they do apply to new applications, um, but this does include continuing applications. Um, we've, we've seen situations where, where um, clients maybe didn't appreciate that, that the new application could also be a new continuation application. Um, and the Patent Office just a couple of months ago in March um, eased them for the first time started granting applicants who are desiring track one status some flexibility on meeting some of those requirements. They used to be very, very strict, um, but now they're trying um, this interim rule, rule that lets you have a little more time to get your declaration in and pay some of those excess claim fees. Um, in general, we would still recommend that you go ahead and comply with everything um, in that initial filing um, to get the maximum benefit of the speed of processing of track one. And then the other nice thing about track one is that it's also available for continued examination. So you can file a track one with your request for continued examination or prior to an office action in an RCE. Uh, I guess on the chemical biotech side, we have a, a fair amount of experience filing track ones in this situation uh, compared to the electronics industry where we're, you know, we don't need to usually worry about trying to get a patent before the product is obsolete. You know, we tend not to need to 
in many circumstances get examination started quickly. But once it gets started, uh, we've had a problem with uh, filing the RCEs and then having the application go and sit back in queue for another two years before the examiner picks up again. Uh, finally, uh, you can also enter U.S. prosecution from a PCT and use track one, but you can't use the traditional 371 national phase entry. Um, the, the way to do this would be to file a bypass continuation with your uh, track one uh, petition. And just in the timing, once your track one application is filed, how the patent office handles it, um, it does jump to the top of the examiner's queue uh, once it's granted. So you file it, the patent office does send a notice that actually indicates that you've been accepted for the track one uh, program. Uh, it jumps to the examiner's queue and that the examiner's, um, you know, it goes on their docket, their workflow, and that they're expected to act on it, um, you know, very soon. Um, and then also, when they do the issue of the office action, the track one applicant is expected to respond in the normal response uh, time periods um, that's set um, in the office action. Um, if you do take an extension of time, um, then you uh, would terminate sort of the prioritized examination. So be sure to comply with the, with the normal response times that are set. Um, also, you need to keep those claims if you're preparing amendments or adding new claims or canceling claims. You need to make sure that the claim total is uh, remains less than third, remains 30 or less, and also that the independent claim uh, limitation of four or less is met. The Patent Office has been um, providing a number of um, statistics on Track One. I refer you to their website for the latest. Um, these, these aren't too out of date; they're probably from April. Um, I, I present them here just to give you a snapshot of the volume that we're seeing in Track One um, over the last three years. We're actually seeing a steady increase. Uh, in the number of filings um, under Track 1 as companies and inventors um, get used to the process, um, um, weave it into their strategies. Uh, you can see, for example, like 2012, there's 5,000 filed. 2013, it jumped up to 6,800. And uh, we're on a healthy pace for fiscal year 2014 as well, already 3,700 or more. And we're seeing it across all technology centers. Like John said, I think some of the life science um, companies are in situations where they don't necessarily need, uh, you know, fast first office action and maybe a first blush for does this apply to me. Um, but we're seeing that um, a number of different situations across the tech centers and the patent office, from life science to electronics to the mechanical area. Um, if you look at the count of um, track ones filed, it, it's fairly even in many of the areas. Maybe we can get ahead. Um, there's some additional um, strategies. Um, and, and, and this is where, um, for, for attorneys, um, it, it's interesting. Some are set by rule, like track one, um, that are, you know, it's a, it's a formal rulemaking process to authorize it. Other ones are pilot programs that the patent office um, makes available, tries them out, sees that they work, takes um, feedback. Um, one of them is, um, during the prosecution of a patent application, when you get to the after final stage, the patent office has a program which we call the AFCP 2.0 program, or just 2.0 program, um, that basically deals with the issue of uh, you're trying to file an amendment after final. And it's one of those areas where examiners have a lot of discretion in how they, they view that amendment and whether or not it raises a new issue that requires a new search. And it's an area that, that's been identified patent office is maybe an area where we can optimize the processing, try to accelerate it a bit, and avoid unnecessary requests for continued examination or extensions of prosecution. This program is addressed at that, that, that juncture. And what you do is you um, file a one-page request. Uh, you uh, elect the amendment after final uh, program. You file your amendment um, after final like normal course. The good news is there's no extra fee for this. Um, and the examiners are obligated to uh, give patent applicants who, fall, who file for this pilot program a call to basically um, talk to the applicant about whether or not that amendment after final will get entered. Um, on the patent office processing side, the examiners are given a little extra time at their end for their production purposes to 
uh, assess whether or not that amendment after file should be entered. And the hope of the program, and this is kind of what the program is trying to, to, to uh, achieve, is to give a little more flexibility so the amendments that really are moving prosecution forward, but at the same time aren't raising a lot of significant new issues that require new search, that, that maybe that set of cases uh, can be handled a little more expeditiously. Um, frankly, we're having mixed results with this. Um, we're seeing a lot of situations where, um, yes, the examiners are giving extra consideration to these amendments after final, um, but they're still deciding it raises issues that require an RCE. Um, however, we are encountering situations where we presented some amendments that um, are beyond just typographical kind of things, and the examiner has taken advantage of the program, has gotten the extra time to do a search, and has called us and said, yes, we'll put this in condition for allowance where I think we've got the benefit of what this pilot program is trying to achieve. And for some, I think, older practitioners, this pilot program looks a little bit like what we may have thought after final practice was 15 or 20 years ago. And, you know, with the advent of RCEs, the, the examiners tend not to want to do anything after final rejection. And so this, to me, kind of brings it back to where the examiner will look at, at at least small changes to claims and, and, and kind of clean up situations where you're close to allowance and, and can handle that with an after final amendment and reply. And for, for many companies, um, looking at sort of the end to end cost of patent prosecution, um, this particular juncture uh, where you're after final and making some hard decisions about whether you want to appeal, whether or not you want to do an RCE, it's kind of a critical juncture. Uh, so one benefit I'm finding from, from participating in this pilot program is that um, the examiners are required to call. In my experience, they are complying with that. They are calling. And so at this critical juncture, you're getting a call from the examiner one way or another letting you know where your claims stat, uh, where your claims um, status is and where they stand. And those are important things at this juncture. That's probably a good segue to the next topic, which is um, examiner interviews, which uh, maybe you know, they don't show up in pilot programs very often or in the, the legislation, but they, they often do help kind of accelerate prosecution. So one of the things we're finding as a trend in the last year or so is that um, applicants who are uh, willing or that want to accelerate the examination, um, move their cases forward, are moving the interview process forward. There's been some encouragement by PTO management um, on interviewing um, in many of the different art units and tech centers. Um, and, and applicants are finding that moving interviews forward can actually, um, in some ways, um, accelerate focusing of the claims, uh, meeting what the examiner wants. Um, we've, there was a full first action interview pilot program that applicants um, can avail themselves of that actually um, was a very specific program. First it was limited in technology, then it was expanded and enhanced uh, pilot program. And it actually, in a form, more formal way, um, let applicants request an interview in advance. Um, what we're finding in an informal way is that when you get a first office action, um, the issue is um, you actually interview even before you file the reply. Um, many situations, um, it was common where you would file the reply and then interview, um, sometimes even after final office action. But we're finding um, pretty um, effective results with interviewing um, even before filing that draft reply, filing a reply to the first office action. So how do you do this? How do you carry this out? Uh, one way is um, that, you know, there's a lot of examiner discretion. They can, they can say, no, I want to see something writing first. Um, but we've been calling them up, asking the examiners for interview. Um, they're routinely asking for an agenda. Um, and then even providing with an agenda having the interview, by the time you file that first reply, it's more likely to focus the claims and the arguments in a, in a way that um, helps meet the examiner's expectation and move prosecution forward in many situations. Um, we're also finding for certain cases where um, actually having a complete draft reply with full remarks and full proposed amendments so the examiner can actually decide um, in advance of the interview um, so by the time you actually go in for the interview, the examiner has the benefit of that full thinking. They actually give you their comments on it. So then you take those comments and then finalize that draft reply 
it's even more likely that that draft of buy um, is going to advance prosecution in a favorable way if there is some allowable subject matter there. Yeah, I think you know the, the follow-up to that is you know, there's many situations where we read a cursory rejection and and we think we understand kind of the examiner's position and how he's combining references or or how he's alleging or the the specification kind of lacks in detail or, or sufficiency. And when we get to an interview, we find that you know, we kind of misapprehended the, the examiner's written position and really having a discussion with the examiner, flushing out kind of what, what the examiner thinks is, are the issues, uh, really leads us to, to be able to kind of attack the rejections in a much more efficient way, usually get it in, in the reply to the first office action rather than two or three subsequent office actions really kind of understanding what's concerning the examiner. In my own senses, um, from interviewing earlier in the process, I think we're achieving at least a 0.5 RCE savings, <laughs> and uh, might even be an entire RCE savings just because issues are getting joined earlier in the process, dealt with and addressed in an efficient way. Uh, one, one potential downside is uh, interviewing early. Uh, what happens if a final office action does occur, uh, agreement's not reached, um, examiner finds new art, um, have you basically kind of burned your one interview um, and now you're asking for a second interview sort of in the same cycle? And many, it, it's a real issue in that many examiners are kind of calibrated to just let one interview per cycle happen. Um, but we're finding that that really is varying. Um, the MPP has some language about normally one interview is permitted after final that sometimes you can use to your advantage. Um, other times, um, many examiners, and you just have to um, um, you know, make the request with your particular examiner, uh, but some of them, even if they've had one interview after first office action, we're finding are quite open to having another final office action and actually kind of continue that dialogue. Um, because you had the first interview, they're even more likely to have that dialogue. Other ones are a little more strict. Um, it just has to depend on a particular uh, case that you're handling. So, Mike, there is a question um, just that, that goes to the mechanics of how do you request um, to be in the, the 2.0 program um, and, and make your request to have your after final amendment considered? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's, a, there's a form available on the Patent Office website that actually makes that request. And so by completing the form, you basically um, check the box that um, you're requesting the form and it, um, it, it if the Patent Office um, complies with it. So I would encourage you to just look on the Patent Office website and you'll see that form and um, it'll indicate um, it, it'll indicate its request. So that's a good segue to, um, there's another similar pilot program to the 2.0 program. It's called the Quick Path IDS program. And this is another um, targeted effort in the, um, by the Patent Office in a, in a pilot program to see is there a point in prosecution um, where unnecessary delay is happening and we can make some changes that would um, accelerate handling of it and avoid unnecessary delay. And this one deals with you paid the issue fee um, and now some new information's um, come about. Um, often this could be a foreign search report raising new, um, new art and, and new issues um, than you're aware of. Um, or um, current litigation is going on and new litigation information um, becomes aware. But you've already paid the issue fee, so traditionally that wouldn't be allowed into the, the patent office at this stage. You'd have to withdraw from issue. Um, under the Quick Path um, IDS program, you can um, file what's a, basically it's a conditional RCE. So the way the patent office thinks about it is you, you request the Quick Path, and it is a, a certification request form like the 2.0 form. It's a one-page form, um, PTO SB09 form that you fill out and it basically requests participation in this program. And you file an information disclosure statement. You do have to certify under Rule 97E to qualify for this program because it's a pretty extraordinary thing. You're after issue fee, trying to get new information in. Um, you certify, uh, make that certification under 97E um, to the extent that it, it, you qualify. Uh, and then you actually file the, the RCE. But the Patent Office will treat it like a conditional RCE. And that's kind of the, the Patent Office's words. They treat it like a conditional RCE. So the examiner will review the information. If they do decide it raises an issue of 
unpatentability and they need to reopen prosecution, then they'll proceed down that path and use the RCE to do that. If they look at that information and conclude that it remains allowable, um, then they won't trigger the RCE and won't charge you the fee, um, and you continue on track to allowance. You do need to file this, um, though, with an EFS web, the Patent Office Filing System, uh, with an e-petition to withdraw. Um, so that way, uh, as part of the program, they have that conditional RCE, they have that withdrawal if they need it in place. Okay, we, um, we had a, a follow-on question with respect to the first full action interview pilot program, and the question was whether this program applied to all patent filings or only those that you have uh, requested to be fast-tracked under the track one. Um, excellent question. That full um, action pilot program, um, you know, several years ago, it applied to certain technologies. It got expand what they called the enhanced full action interview pilot program, and that applied to all technologies. Um, it's actually completely separate, completely independent of Track One. So it applies to um, all all applications uh, independent of Track One, um, and it applies irrespective of technologies. Um, as of today, the Patent Office website um, indicates um, these pilot programs have to get renewed each year. As of today, the Patent Office website um, um, it indicated that it expired in November 2012 um, and um, that it had not been renewed for that. Um, and so we're actually, um, I reached out to the Patent Office today to get some more confirmation on whether or not it will be renewed or not. Um, but at the, mo at, the, at the earlier slide, we put a little asterisk um, because we're finding that, um, you know, it may not be available the way it was at the end of 2012. That being said, we had one, somebody here file one recently that was accepted. So it's uh, like there's a little bit of confusion. And the Patent Office did indicate on that same website that they were going to issue a notice renewing the program and setting a new expiration date. All righty. So maybe we can just talk strategy in terms of how companies are actually starting to use these fast tracks when they're picking up their tools, uh, when they're finding it advantageous. And so, you know, obviously, kind of, there are certain circumstances when you want to get your application examined quickly and, and get a patent. Um, you know, you have the opportunity here to basically have a, your application examined and issued before a competitor even knows that you filed. If, if you go straight in even without requesting a, a request not to publish. If you can get a, a patent issued in nine months, um, you know, the first that anybody knows that, that you're out there trying the patent um, will be when your patent issues. And so there are some uh, advantages in, in, in many cir circumstances that, to pursuing that strategy. Uh, startups in a fast-moving technology area um, you know, may want to uh, get the certainty of having an issued patent to kind of satisfy investors. Um, again, in these fast-moving technology areas, you know, getting getting your stake in the ground and, and having your right to exclude others, uh, you know, can be your kind of sword for entry into a new space. Uh, your publication of the patent document prior to 18 months by getting it issued early also acts as a shield against competitors that may file later. And so, uh, you know, you, you quickly are, are establishing uh, prior art against others as well. Um, and, and we're seeing um, it, a fast track strategy is really playing a role in some of the benchmarking with our clients' patent spending, uh, especially with sort of the newer, uh, newer products coming out um, in the software space or other areas, business method related space, um, where there's some uncertainty on the eligibility of the subject matter. Uh, we're finding some of the companies are taking advantage of, especially track one and other acceleration strategies. Um, to identify certain assets uh, for fast track examination, uh, getting office actions in a couple of months, um, which helps them determine whether or not they want to double down or spend additional resources filing additional patent applications on their products, um, having had the benefit of an initial read from the patent office. Um, and in, in some ways, I think it's uh, making a lot of decision makers feel more comfortable about how much uh, the level of benchmarking, the level of patent spend to put into their patent portfolios up front. And we're saying that you know, even on the, the life sciences side, especially in the life cycle management portion of, of a portfolio development, where you have later developments, later um, 
inventions, maybe new uses for already approved products where it's very important to determine whether or not you're going to get patent protection, even for the business people to make decisions such as whether to sponsor clinical trials uh, or you know, trying to get a, a patent issued and quickly and placed onto the, into the orange book to prevent generic competition. And so um, you see a lot of uh, opportunities for fast track prosecution kind of in the later stages in, uh, in the pharma and biotech industries as well. And, and we mentioned before on patent litigation, or concurrent patent litigation, um, we're seeing a lot of these fast track strategies play an increasing role. Um, the way I think of it is if you're in a situation uh, where you're in patent litigation, your first phone call um, should be to your patent litigator and at the same time you call your patent prosecutor with respect to fast track options because um, we're finding um, plaintiffs and defendants are looking at their patent portfolios and finding which aspects of them they can adjust their claims, do track one continuations, file new ones to the extent there's new technology around in that space. Um, either way, augment their position to reinforce their litigation situation. Um, and then just on a practical side, many of the companies um, you know, just using fast track um, with respect to um, many country, uh, companies have certain filing goals. Um, fast track can help meet some of those filing goals for patent numbers, um, as well as just from a pure efficiency perspective um, in terms of looking at the end to end spend, our fast track, um, as, is it actually reducing the overall spend? Um, and, you know, one of our questioners asked, are there statistics available on using sort of some of these different individual tools, either the interviewing or the AFC 2.0 or the Quick Path or even Track One, collectively to kind of reduce the the end-to-end -end cost. Um, at the moment, I'm not aware of sophisticated studies on that. Um, anecdotally and based on our experience, I'm doing over hundreds of, of these cases and these types of filings. Um, we're finding um, that because of the compressed time period, um, as I mentioned before, um, especially with Track One. Um, the attorneys, the inventors, the in-house counsel, there's just a lot of efficiencies when you're prosecuting within months of filing. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if people find that they're making better decisions um, on their portfolios and, and actually getting better results with their money um, in a, on a compressed time scale versus some of the longer ones. Um, of course, you have to watch out for some of the pitfalls. Um, if you go too fast uh, and the rest of your portfolio uh, might not um, you, you know, benefit from that. Yeah, there are certain circumstances where, you know, especially with all the development and obviousness type double patenting law, where, you know, if you're, you're prosecuting an application that's in the same family as, as the patent that you've gotten a, a lot of patent term adjustment on, and you end up getting something that issues fairly quickly, uh, you know, you're not going to have patent term adjustment there, and, and the question will, will be whether or not, you know, that an obvious type double patenting would kind of take away any type of patent term adjustment that you've collected on one of the other patents in your portfolio. Um, and, you know, obviously, you know, there are certain people are, are kind of used to kind of a slow prosecution. And so, you know, here you really need to make sure your application and claims are in good shape, that you've done some searching, that you have an IDS ready to go because the first office action is going to come out very quickly. And so, um, you know, if you're going to use fast track, you have to be very well prepared up front, and, and it may take away, um, you know, it may not be a strategy to use where you, you want to inflexibly pursue very broad claim coverage um, and, you know, just kind of hammer away for a long time at the patent office. So, you know, you're really going to have to go in um, with a claim set where you can do some negotiation. Yeah, I think that's well put. Sometimes the way I explain it to clients is I think to make the maximum use of track one in terms of what it's well suited for is you put on this track one mindset in that you're kind of coming in with a claim scope that um, is effective and focused. Um, you kind of know your most narrow scope that you, you're willing to take. You also know the broad one that you're trying as well as some intermediate range scope and you're willing to enter a negotiation with the examiner. Um, so that's, that's their expectation and that's where you get the maximum benefit from it. So before we leave track one, we have one additional question, whether there were um, statistics that demonstrated that all these accelerated prosecution options, what, what's the 
result on kind of the normal people or the normal applications? Are they being slowed down by all of this? Yeah, I think it's hard to say. Um, I mentioned the, the track one. We already have 6,000. Um, we have 6,000 filed this year. Um, my sense is um, that you know might have a bit of an effect, but compared to the overall numbers that the Patent Office gets each year, it's still small enough where it's not diverting resources away. Um, and at, at the time of the AIA, the Patent Office indicated that you know the fees would be used to hire extra examiners in order to be able to do this without impacting applications that were in the normal queue. Um, I don't know if the, there's any data though to, to show whether that's happening. Well, let's touch on some of the international um, options because um, for, for many companies, multinational companies, um, having a patent portfolio across uh, country boundaries is important. And um, the acceleration strategy should really be go hand in hand in terms of how you're accelerating in the United States and other international countries. The primary vehicle that has kind of evolved over the last several years is the patent prosecution highway. There's a lot, of, it's a pretty well established highway now. Um, it continues to, to improve and get modified. Um, there's a lot of information available at the U.S. Patent Office website as well as the Japanese Patent Office website. Um, and there are direct acceleration strategies in individual countries. So I'd encourage people to reach out to your, your, uh, your foreign council, uh, whether it's in Europe or Japan, and ask them about options available. And some of these actually have um, um, no fees involved um, as well. Um, so it's worth what, uh, asking out for that. And then finally, um, there are um, different patent offices which offer acceleration options for special technologies, like John mentioned earlier in the area of green technology, clean tech, renewable energies. You may qualify there as well. It's, um, the patent prosecution highway uh, is worth doing a little deeper dive on that. Um, it's getting used more and more often um, and does provide some pretty significant advantages. So if you look at the average disposition time from the time you request patent, pros patent prosecution highway to the final disposition uh, disposition of the case internationally, it can be like 10.7 months. In the United States, there's no cost for um, filing on the patent prosecution highway. I think that's true for many countries, many other um, participating patent offices. Uh, we'll get into it, but there is a new pilot that just launched in January 2014 that just um, helps um, Companies use um, common forms across some of the offices. Uh, another indication of how they're trying to make it, um, you know, simpler and efficient for applicants to take advantage of. Um, and there's a high allowance rate, which we'll, we'll get into as we go through some of the statistics. Here's um, the, the current um, patent prosecution highway country participants, and this is changing all the time. So um, always check to see the latest um, opportunities that might be available. Um, there's a group of them, kind of the major ones that handle the most volume, um, the Chinese Patent Office, the European Patent Office, Korea, U.S., Japan. They're the group of the IP5. Um, they're the ones that just had in January that recent agreement to use the common forms and do some simplification administratively. Um, and then there's a, a number of other country uh, patent offices that are also involved in different ways of the patent prosecution highway. Um, you know, Russia and Israel, uh, Finland, um, Great Britain. You just need to look um, to see um, which countries are, have opted into the process and when. Um, this is kind of a collaboration between patent office. So a lot of this arises out of bilateral agreements between the different offices. Um, so you have to really check to make sure those agreements apply. They're in place. The pilot period um, is still running, hasn't expired. Um, before you actually um, take advantage of the highway. Um, I just put together, um, you know, there's a number of resources online, the U.S. Patent Office or the Japanese Patent Office are two good ones. Um, to actually comply with this, you just actually file a request form. And we'll get into more details later of the substantive things. Um, and um, I just put some links for your convenience to some of the, the request forms that the different uh, participating offices provide. And so the basic premise, kind of the way this works, is kind of a recognition that um, offices can, can take advantage of the good work that another patent office has already done. Um, so if you filed in one patent office, uh, you've got an indication of allowable subject matter, uh, meaning that the, the main patentability criteria have been met of you know, the United States, novelty, obviousness, and um, eligibility. Uh, internationally, uh, making sure that it's industrial applicable, novelty, invent, inventive step. Um, you've got that indication of allowability. 
And it doesn't have to be all allowable claims. It just has to have at least some allowable subject matter in there. Once you have that, you can take that information, request the patent prosecution highway, and then the other patent office um, will take that and then examine your case out of order. That's how the patent prosecution highway is. Take that good news of allowable subject matter, present it to the other patent office, and because you move prosecution to that point, the other patent office will recognize it, and in that what they call later filed or second filed patent office, uh, will advance it out of order in queue and put it on the top of the queue for examination. Um, it's been around for, for quite a while, and there's, there's often no fees. And so eligibility for patent prosecution highway. Um, there have the, the applications that, that you're you're trying to use in this have to have the same priority date. As the, so the later application has to have the same priority date as the earlier application. Um, and there has to be at least one claim deemed allowable. Um, the application with the claim that has been t determined to be novel, inventive, and industrially applicable. Uh, by an international search authority or the international preliminary examination authority is also eligible. Um, so, you, kind of the big threshold here is in the the kind of second application, you must have a claim that sufficiently corresponds to an the, an allowable claim in the uh, corresponding earlier application, um, and a claim that introduces new or different category of claims than those indicated as allowable. Uh, by that first office is not considered to sufficiently correspond. And so you know, here's an area where you know, I think you know, the, the details are, are being worked out over time as to what corresponds and what doesn't. And um, substantive examination uh, has not yet begun in that second application. And we're finding that in practice, um, you know, there, there's some discretion how examiners treat these in terms of how um, rigorous are going to apply some of these, these restrictions too. Um, I think um, many many of the patent offices are, are expecting that along those claims um, sufficiently correspond, um, you know, you might have some good opportunities to, to file under the patent prosecution highway. Here's one of the diagrams um, that sort of show how it works. Um, it's a little busy, um, but it does show the advantage that you get of um, you're in that office of first filing or earlier filed examination, application A, you kind of moved it along with your rejections, your amendments, um, and then you get the allowable indication. But once you get that allowable, you don't even have to wait to grant. Once you get that allowable, um, allowable subject matter indicated, you can immediately go ahead and request your patent prosecution highway treatment in your second application. Many people have confused the initial filing in the second office plus patent, pr patent prosecution highway is having had to have the same time it's not that strict, so you can have your second case pending and then request and then have it accelerated at that time. Um, and like John mentioned, you need to make sure um, what you can't do is um, narrow your claims in the first office to get it allowable and then say, hey, I want patent prosecution highway treat me, treatment, move me to the front of the queue. Um, oh, and by the way, I want broader claims again. Um, that, that's, that's what uh, you're not allowed to do. You need to um, keep it so it sufficiently corresponds to what you got allowed. It also applies to PCT um, in that um, if you did get that initial uh, allowance in a PCT application or your own application, you can also request patent prosecution highway in a PCT application. Um, this is just how the Japanese Patent Office presents um, the advantages uh, from the Japanese uh, Patent Office perspective of patent prosecution highway. Um, they just say, because you've got that office of earlier examined case with the allowable subject matter, if you request patent, pros patent prosecution highway, um, it's going to be a short time to first office action and the total pendency and a much lower cost. They have some additional slides on their website um, that say that it might be like two months to the time you file patent prosecution highway to get that first office action compared to like 26 months from the time you know, if you're not on the patent prosecution highway in Japan. So the timing and efficiency can be quite remarkable. Here are the statistics uh, for patent prosecution highway. Um, and these are actually conservative. Um, I just put the lower numbers on. Um, but the allowance rate is high, 75 plus percent compared to non-patent pro prosecution highway. 
Um, that can seem quite striking. Um, however, if you step back and think about it, um, these are cases that are coming in on the Patent Prosecution Highway with already the claims focused to allowable subject matter. So maybe it's not surprising to see a high allowance rate. This is not like track one and some of the other processes that we talked about where claims were getting accelerated, the cases were getting accelerated, but they were on unexamined claims where you had no um, indication of allowable subject matter yet. Um, same thing with a high first action allowance rate, um, 24 plus percent compared to non-patent prosecution highways. Um, um, so anyway, 24 plus percent. Again, it's the second patent office relying on that work of the first patent office um, to move it forward. Um, the second office um, on the patent prosecution highway is not bound by the allowable subject matter of the first. Um, however, you can see from these statistics, they are recognizing the work that was done to get to that point um, and often um, finding the, the cases allowable as well. Uh, independency, um, it really varies across the offices. There's some really good stats. I put um, a link to one of the most comprehensive stats here for you on the slide deck um, that breaks down each patent, each PPH patent office, all those different countries we've shown in the earlier slide, um, and it has stats for all of them in terms of their allowance rates, dependency. Uh, it's running about one to five months from the time you file your request to the time you file your first office action. Some of the offices are really fast, like Great Britain's like 0.8 months, um, but I just rounded up to one. <laughs> yeah. Some of them are taking closer, like Germany is taking a little closer to the five months. Um, and then even dependency from filing your patent prosecution high request to final decision, um, the overall end-to-end pendency is still very fast, two to 14 months. Um, there's statistics like this available as well um, on the Patent Office that kind of summarize what we just talked about, the high grant rate. Um, this is just the United States um, um, statistics for when it's um, people have filed in other countries and now they're using the U.S. as a past prosecution highway. Um, you see the high grant rate, the high first office action allowance rate, and, uh, and the pendency times as well. So to actually file the Patent Prosecution Highway, um, no additional fees, start off with the good news, um, and then you just fill out the form to, like John said, you need to have in the U.S. at least, they require an actual claim correspondence table to show that mapping of, of claim correspondence, um, and you need to actually affirm that the claims you're presenting on this Patent Prosecution Highway sufficiently correspond to the allowed claims in the other case. And so, yeah, I think, yeah. Basically, here you, you can see the similarities between kind of track one and PPH, at least in the U.S., of, of you know allowing you to cut to the front of the line for examination, um, and then you know probably the psychology that somewhere in your application you have allowable subject matter, and it's kind of identifying that in partnership with the examiner and, and getting something allowed quickly. And so it, you know it, it kind of illustrates the power of both of these um, processes in the U.S. And when you file your PPH, be sure to, in the United States at least, be sure to include the copy of the office action that preceded your notice of grant, um, as well as your IDS. And I, I do want to just mention something. Um, I have not personally used this process, but um, the Japanese uh, website, it's, it's another insight into how these acceleration strategies work. Um, the Japanese um, Patent Office um, indicates this concept, it's a Japanese word, um, motanaya, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing it, but, but the meaning of it is the sense of regret um, when you have the waste, the intrinsic value of an object is not properly utilized. And so under this pilot in the Japanese Patent Office, um, it basically says, we started the patent prosecution highway, there was kind of a built-in assumption that you file your first case, the notice of allowance or allowable subject matter would happen in that one, um, and then in your second later filed case, you would opt for the patent prosecution highway. This pilot just recognizes that um, in the real world, you can have multiple cases pending in different patent offices around the world, and then maybe that second one's faster than the first office, um, depending on pendency and backlog delays and various offices. So it recognizes that you can kind of go the other way and request patent prosecution highway on the first filed application if that's the one that's languishing. Um, so anyway, just keep your, um, I would just encourage people looking to accelerate on the patent prosecution highway to be created, check for various 
pilots like this. Um, they're changing, they're evolving, the countries that are participating are changing, and you might have opportunities um, to um, advance in different ways. And just finally, just touch on some of the direct accelerated examination options that are available. Um, I just put some of the, the European information. Um, you can file um, directly in Europe. There's different stages all along the way, from paying grant fees early to requesting accelerated um, search um, that are low cost or no cost. Um, and the European Patent Office promised to accelerate. So if you're in individual countries, you might even have individual acceleration options you should check out. We touched on the green uh, technologies earlier, so we'll move on to some of the wrap-up and talk about some of the overall strategies for acceleration. So yeah, I think you know, in, in terms of accelerating, uh, this, this places a premium on, on kind of getting things done up front, uh, being very careful with, with defining your invention, searching it, drafting the claims uh, in, a, in a very careful manner, uh, making sure you've got fallback scope that, that you can fall back on. Um, and then that takes you to kind of the next stage, kind of participating in, in kind of these accelerated options. Um, we've got prioritized examination. There's a glossary pilot in the software area, business area that we haven't discussed. Yeah, that's going to start June 2nd. It's quite limited, um, but it's aimed at um, applicants that include a glossary in their patent application and software uh, will be examined out of order and not have to pay that track one fee. Um, you know, there's petitions to make special that are based on age. Um, there's the accelerated act examination that, that we briefly mentioned. And, um, you know, the other kind of partial options, uh, including the full interview first action pilot, interviewing per se, um, the after final pilot, quick path IDS, um, using kind of track one RCE to kind of pick up your examination quickly. And uh, also, we didn't mention this, but uh, filing a pre-appeal brief with your notice of appeal to um, quickly get a read by the two additional kind of examiners at the patent office uh, prior to going to the board. Well, here's some resources that I hope will be helpful for, for you. Um, Patent Office website, you go to that one summary chart that I showed you before, um, that's the link to it. Um, we also have some handouts for some of the new patent portfolio options under the American Events Act. You can click on our website there. Um, there's also a video that describes how Track 1 works. Um, the Chapter 15 of the Patent Office Litigation Textbook has a lot of the concurrent strategies, uh, including Fast Track, um, when you have other assets that are involved in Patent Office litigation. Um, and anyway, hopefully uh, those resources uh, will provide additional information, um, help you when you're in situations involving uh, acceleration of patent examination in the U.S. or worldwide. Well, thank you all. Um, we've enjoyed this um, hour. Um, please go out and accelerate where you can. <laughs> and um, we'll be taking questions. We answered all the ones. Um, as we went, if you have any other questions, we'll keep it open a little bit. Uh, we'll be sure to respond by email um, if we can to help answer questions. And again, um, I have indicated there that if you're interested in receiving a copy of the presentation or also access to the recording of this webinar, this webinar was recorded, um, please send an email to erinwest.us at skgs.com and we'll make sure that you receive that information. Thank you again. <laughs>